Hello, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video, I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease. So this is a part of a series on sickle cell disease that I'm, um, that I'm doing, and this is the second vis video. Um, so in order to understand the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, we need to think about the red blood cell or the erythrocyte. So the red blood cell, a mature erythrocyte, is essentially a bag of cytoplasm that is filled with hemoglobin. There are no organelles in mature erythrocytes. The, all the organelles sort of get pushed out as the cell matures and after the hemoglobin is formed. And so it's just packed with dissolve, hemoglobin that's dissolved in cytoplasm. In fact, if you dry out a red blood cell, 95% of the dry weight of a mature red blood cell is from hemoglobin. Okay, so and not surprisingly, sickle cell disease is a disease of a deformation of hemoglobin. Okay, so here I've drawn a picture of a one single hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin molecule is made up of four polypeptide chains that make up the one protein, and these have um, loose hydrogen bind bonding between them, so it makes um, a single protein molecule. And each um, chain of polypeptide has in the center of it, sort of held in the center of it, a heme pigment, and it's this heme pigment that bonds with, a, uh, with oxygen and allows the hemoglobin to carry oxygen which is the main function of hemoglobin and the main function of red blood cells is, is to carry oxygen from the lungs to tissues for cells to use. Now there's actually several different types of hemoglobin in the body but the main type that adults have is a hemoglobin called hemoglobin A which stands for adult hemoglobin. Now there are other, now 97 percent uh, in a normal adult has he, um, of hemoglobin in a normal adult is, is hemoglobin A. Um, there are other types. One is called hemoglobin F, which is fetal hemoglobin, and this makes up about 3% of normal adult hemoglobin, and obviously it's the most common type in, in fetuses, and it sort of slowly goes away and gets replaced by hemoglobin A during the first few months of life. Hemoglobin F becomes important when we talk about um, when we talk about treatments for, uh, for sickle cell disease because one of the treatments actually involves increasing the concentration of hemoglobin F and replacing some of hemoglobin A with hemoglobin F using a medication called, called hydroxyurea. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to talk more about what hemoglobin A is. Hemoglobin A is made up of four polypeptide chains. There are two alpha chains so there's two alpha chains and there are two beta chains. And that's what makes up the four chains that make up the hemoglobin protein. Sickle cell disease involves a tiny mutation that causes a chain in, change in the beta chains of the hemoglobin molecule. In fact, it's one single amino acid. There's 146 amino acids that make up this beta chain. And um, one of them, in fact, it's the sixth one in the sixth position of the beta chain, gets changed from what is normally an uh, amino acid called glutamate, and it is change, changed to valine. And this one tiny little change of one of the 146 amino acids in hemoglobin A changes the hemoglobin A into what we call hemoglobin S, and the S stands, stands for sickling. So normal, normal hemoglobin A usually stays nicely dissolved in the cytoplasm of the, of the erythrocytes, but what happens is hemoglobin S has this valine molecule, and the valine molecule of one beta chain of hemoglobin S tends to want to stick to when it is in a deoxygenated state. So a, a bond forms a reversible bond forms in between these two valine molecules. And what happens is these begin to form a little stack or a chain called a polymer. 
All right, so if you if you can imagine, this kind of continues, and we get you know this long chain, this long straight rigid chain of hemoglobin molecules that are all connected together. Now, so the hemoglobin is now not nicely dissolved, but it all sort of forms together into a long. So let's imagine what's happening inside the cell now. So instead of just having nicely dissolved hemoglobin, the deoxygenated hemoglobin S is forming these long chains that are connected together. And so they sort of form themselves into these long, what are called polymers. In fact, the process is called polymerization. So they've organized themselves in the chain. So if you can imagine what's happening to the wall of the erythrocyte, it's getting stretched out into a sickle shape. So and as these sort of form together, no longer do we have a nice round erythrocyte, but we end up with sort of this sort of sickle shape with rigid, rigid rods or rigid polymers inside of it. Okay, so now we don't have nice round erythrocytes that can, um, that can change shape and are pliable and can flow through narrow vessels. Now we have these long, rigid shaped erythrocytes that tend to get stuck in vessels. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what precipitates vaso-occlusive crises in um, patients with hemoglobin S. And a vaso-occlusive crisis, for those of you who haven't watched my first video, is when um, many of the cells sickle and um, clog up vessels and um, as they th um, occlude vessels it causes um, ischemia and infarction to t tissues that are distal to that occlusion. So you end up with sort of the stack of sickled cells. So what precipitates that? Well we know that hemoglobin S when it is deoxygenated and I'm going to represent that with a bluish color here. If we have um, a significant concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin S, then it is going to precipitate. But, so, well imagine that this is a cell with a person with um, sickle cell disease and, you know, we've got an oxygen saturation of you know, in the in the veins of about 60%. So a little bit more than half of the hemoglobin S is still oxygenated. So that might not be enough to cause this to precipitate. What will cause it to precipitate is if the percentage of deoxygenated hemoglobin S increases, and that will increase the concentration. All right. So what will cause that? Well, obviously, decrease oxygen. Right. So that can be caused by hypoxia. It can be caused by um, a patient that is short of breath, a patient that has asthma, a patient that has pneumonia. Um, it could be a local decrease in oxygen from a decrease in perfusion. So we could have an area of ischemia. Now this can be precipitated by cold temperatures. So if your fingers are cold, that's going to cause uh, vaso, uh, vasoconstriction in your fingers and it's going to decrease perfusion. And that is going to t cause sort of local tissue hypoxia, right? And that's going to increase the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin S and increase the chance that it may start to precipitate together and form polymers, right? Another thing that can cause an increased concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin S is if we take this erythrocyte and we dehydrate it, so it now has a smaller volume, but it has the same amount of hemoglobin in both deoxygenated and oxygenated hemoglobin S and it's going to kind of smush all the molecules together um, and increase the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin S in the same space, right? So there's still the same proportion of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin S but it's confined to a smaller area and this also will make it more likely that the hemoglobin the deoxygenated hemoglobin S will begin to precipitate and form polymers. And the last major factor to uh, increase that cause poly polymerization is, is acidosis.